the surgery was uh, they had to do around 37 weeks because that was a fourth pregnancy with, with past three cesarean sections and at any time they she could have gone into labor making it an emergency situation so it was planned to do early around 37 weeks so we had one week so um, she was already on double dose iron therapy and by the time we saw the patient she had been given two units of blood for hemoglobin of eight grams so with that uh, those two units of blood the hb had become 10.5 and we thought that was acceptable we didn't want to give any more blood to her and um, and in addition she was seen by our resident physician to optimize her on the bronchial asthma side and inhalers were you know prescribed on regular inhalers and um, so we uh, plan to do her uh, one week later and uh, as usual we uh, gave her aspiration prophylaxis kept her fasting for six hours and we have uh, we reserved six units of blood with cryoprecipitate 20 units and FFT and platelets and we informed the blood bank and the transfusion specialist we we told them that, uh, we might need more blood um, so to keep all positive blood more blood available and we reserved the bed in icu and in addition we in addition to the obstetric team we also discussed with uh, her husband and family uh, regarding the possible hysterectomy and uh, difficulties, uh, the possibility of massive bleeding and need for blood transfusions and uh, need for post-op ICU care. Um, and then uh, the consultant, anesthetist and the obstetrician had a discussion and we had a um, agreed plan. Um, uh, what are we going to do? So there, the, the obstetrician's plan was to preserve the, he normally with his experience, he's going for uterine preserving surgery rather than uh, hysterectomy. So he said uh, he would go for uterine preserving surgery and we decided to do it under combined spinal epidural anesthesia with uh, invasive monitoring. So in the theater, uh, the patient was taken in and we have inserted uh, two uh, 14 gauge cannuli and started warm ring lactate infusion slowly and um, the intraarterial radial um, uh, artery was cannulated and the monitoring began and in addition right internal tubular vein was also cannulated and normal monitoring basic monitoring started uh, with temperature. Uh, then the rapid warmer infuser, patient warmer, and uh, was kept ready. And in addition, the normal the, the drum warmers also kept ready. And uh, we have informed the ICU uh, to keep the rotum ready. And the MO was informed that uh, we will be sending samples soon. So to be ready to do the, uh, the rotum tests as we uh, send samples. And uh, we have checked the anesthetic equipment and the emergency drugs kept ready and consultant anesthetists and the obstetricians. Both of um, them were in the theater physically managing the patient from the beginning, uh, from the time the patient was taken into the theater. And all OT staff also um, was aware about the, that we were going to, about to start a, a case where the major hemorrhage can um, occur. So, and maybe inform the blood bank just before um, starting the case that we need a cryoprecipitate to tow cryo cryoprecipitate 10 units because it takes time to prepare cryoprecipitate. Uh, so, as soon as we need, we can give it if the, if the cryo is already thawed. Right. So, the uh, combined spinal uh, epidural was inserted and achieved the adequate level of um, anesthesia for surgery and surgery commenced and the verbal and verbal communication was uh, maintained throughout the case that is communicating between the obstetric team and the anesthetist uh, informing each other what is happening what is going on right then the the obstetrician delivered the fetus via a normal incision normal fan and steel incision and um, soon after delivery of the fetus uh, syntocinone 5 units was given and the 10 units per hour, the maximum infusion uh, of syntocinone started per hour. 
an agamectrin was also given with uh, ondansetron to prevent vomiting and tranexamic acid 1 gram was given prophylactically before waiting for bleeding. So that 1 gram slow IV was given prophylactically. And then the obstetrician removed the placenta slowly, step by step, attending to the bleeders. Right, so it was a slow process and um, especially attending to those uh, what are called neo blood vessels, right? So uh, it was a slow process, gradually uh, removing parts of the placenta step by step. So we gave prophylactic antibiotics, then the patient started to bleed. So um, now the, there was rapid bleeding. So uh, we have commenced the red cell concentrate through the rapid boma, which was already connected, we, we anticipated that to happen. So started blood quickly. So the blood was going very rapidly, uh, volume to volume, like uh, to uh, match the rate of blood loss. So as the patient was bleeding, we were giving blood. So we didn't wait for any major loss. We started blood as soon as the patient started to bleed. And in addition, phenylephrine boluses were also given to keep the blood pressure because despite our um, uh, rapid uh, replacement of loss, still the pressure was tend to drop. So we have given um, judicious uh, doses of phenylephrine, the vasoconstrictor. Uh, we preferred phenylephrine over ephedrine we got to minimize the tachycardia. Now with bleeding also patient becomes tachycardic and with the ephedrine, the heart rate can go up further. So phenylephrine was given. And then despite that the pressure was going down, so we needed the, the temporary direct aortic compression by the um, obstetrician until we fill up the uh, vascular compartment for a few minutes. Um, twice that was done, twice during surgery to maintain the blood pressure, uh, at least above 80. And, uh, uh, and during surgery, we were talking to the patient and um, we were reassuring her and we, uh, we have given her oxygen, uh, low flow mask to uh, improve the oxygen delivery. Uh, continuous monitoring was carried out and uh, the first uh, rotum sample was taken when the blood loss reached around one liter. And in addition, we have done the arterial blood gas and the capillary blood sugar. And uh, so the blood components were replaced according to the rotum result. So we, we were ready. So sample was quickly sent to the, the ICU. And within uh, 10 minutes, we were able to get the report because it's um, our own department. It was a point of care uh, rotum. So we got the report. And um, repeat dose of tranexamic acid was also given in between. So here you can see during the procedure, um, the, we were... Uh, Everybody was trying to manage, and you can see here the rapid warmer connected. And the importance of rapid warmer is that we, we don't have to, uh, after connecting, um, it will run the blood very fast. So we don't have to adjust, do any pumping, hand, hand uh, you know, squeezing all. We don't have to do very easy to manage the, the bleeding, the, replace the blood. So here are the all these pictures. This is at the beginning, like the, the number of swabs, and then we got the re rotum report. And we, uh, so this was the first rotum report. Um, we are the A5 fib tem uh, was um, eight, X tem was normal. So we, uh, according to the, uh, this is uh, for the obstetric patients, this algorithm, the dose calculation chart were used and the required dose was calculated. And uh, now the cryo was already available and we needed 10 units and four 10 units was available because we had informed and got it ready. So uh, that was given. And then the repeat rotum was done after about half an hour while the bleeding was still, I mean, patient was continuing to bleed. So uh, it was corrected to some extent, but still she needed further five, minute, five units. So that was also given. Uh, and corrected. So at the end of the surgery, uh, the time taken for surgery was about two hours and the blood loss was 4,000 ml. And we had given uh, red cell concentrates, seven units, ring lactate um, only one liter and cryoprecipitate 15 units only. No other blood products were given. 
and uh, our uh, the full blood count at that time it was around 11.2 and the platelet was 180 and blood blood gas was there was no major abnormality uh, capillary blood sugar was normal and uh, calcium was also normal we had given calcium in addition so then we uh, in the um, icu patient was taken to the icu and uh, we continued the monitoring in addition observed for the um, the, the further blood loss so um, abdominal girth was measured and uh, she was examined from time to time to see whether there was any vaginal bleeding and pain relief was continued with the, continued with the epidural infusion and we kept the patient warm with the patient warmer and um, and then oral liquid was commenced on the same day afternoon the surgery was uh, over by uh, about uh, 12 noon and uh, in the evening around 3 by 4 o'clock oral um, liquids commenced and the repeat rotum was normal and patient was mobilized towards the evening and um, light diet was also given in the night and uh, following day the hemoglobin came as 9.5 and there was no, we accepted that as okay. We didn't give any further transfusions. And then she was sent to the ward um, on the, uh, the following day. And uh, she was discharged home from the ward on the third post of day. Thank you. We'll do the discussion at the, towards the latter part. Uh, thank you, dear madam, for that uh, very interesting case. Uh, I'm Dr. Yunania Santika, uh, Senior Registrar in Anesthesiology, currently working at uh, National Hospital of Sri Lanka. So, uh, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and I should thank the Sri Lanka Medical Association for giving this opportunity to present in third uh, monthly clinical meeting in the year of 2022. So um, I'm going to talk on a trauma case uh, related to patient blood management. Uh, just uh, there, you will see a lot of contradictory points as well as uh, plus point in relation to patient uh, blood management in this case. Just uh, concentrate on the uh, management uh, that uh, it has been done. Um, so moving on to the case, he is a 28-year-old gentleman met with a train accident on 31st of uh, December 2021 around 8.30 p.m. at Vallavatta. And he was admitted to the nearest hospital, which was a teaching uh, tertiary care hospital around 9 o'clock. On admission to the hospital, in primary survey, the airway, airway was patent. And in breathing, there was no abnormality, but he has low pulse volume with tachycardia, 140 beats per minute, and blood pressure was 70 by 50 millimeter mercury. So they have achieved IV access, and patient was initially resuscitated with two liters of crystalloids, that is normal saline and uh, Ringer's lactate. Uh, although we usually go up to one liter of crystalloid in initial resuscitation in bleeding trauma patient. And further, he was uh, treated with three units of cross match blood there. Yeah. And uh, they have started this patient on noradrenaline infusion at a rate of 0.3 mics per kg per minute uh, as the blood pressure was not rising up to the expected level. He was conscious and GCS was 15 out of 15 and patient was normothermic and there were external injuries on occipital and parietal region and he could not move his lower limbs at all. So fast scan uh, there showed grade two splenic laceration with mild amount of free fluid in the abdomen. Radiological findings revealed occipital and left parietal bone fractures with underlying pneumocephalus. He had L1, L2 spinal fracture, but there were no C-spine, chest or pelvic injuries. He had right tibial fibular compound fracture. 
but at uh, this condition, they have taken the decision to transfer this patient to NHSL to manage mainly the spinal trauma that happened around 12.50 a.m. on the same night. So on admission to the uh, R room, resuscitation room, his blood pressure was still low, 85 by 50 with tachycardia, 115 beats per minute with low pulse volume. And this was with the noradrenaline infusion at a rate of 0.5 mics per kg per minute. So they have activated the massive transfusion protocol uh, to uh, uh, do uh, ratio-based blood and blood products trans uh, resuscitation. But at that time, he, he was treated with two units of blood and five units of platelets. But with this, noradrenaline infusion has been reduced to up to 0.2 mics per kg per minute. At the same time, they have sent a blood sample for autumn point of care coagulation. And as the second fast scan also revealed grade two splenic laceration, moderate amount of free fluids in the abdomen and hemodynamically unstable patient. That decision was taken for emergency laparotomy that was around 3.30 a.m. in the morning. So at the theater, the patient was intubated with rapid sequence induction. They have inserted the right internal jugular venous, central venous line. Surgical findings, sir, patient had grade two splenic injury, hemoperitoneum, mesenteric tear and bowel injury. And there was a non-viable bowel segment from the splenic flexure to the sigmoid region. And um, left-sided uh, retroperitoneal hematoma with suspected renal injury. So they have done the left hemicolectomy and abdominal packing and closed with the laparostomy as a part of damage control surgery in under the damage control resuscitation. So further, he had the tibial fibular fracture that they have done the wound toilet and POP backslab has been applied. So total duration of the surgery was two hours and 30 minutes and blood loss during the surgery was 1,500 ml. That might be underestimated further that there is concealed bleeding that is in the retroperitoneal hematoma. He had a urine output of 250 ml. By this time, even the rotum report has not been available. So that patient was treated with three units of blood, 10 units of SFP, five units of platelets, and 10 units of cryoprecipitate. And they could tail off the noradrenaline infusion at the end. So intraoperative ABG showed metabolic acidosis with high lactate. And then uh, the rotum report was available at the end of the surgery. So this is the rotum report. This was, uh, this is, they haven't got a printable report that they have over the phone told that the rotum is normal, that you can see uh, that uh, it is sent at the R room before that, that bunch of blood and product transfusion have been happened. So if he, uh, if it was available by that time as a point of care test, that uh, this much of blood products transfusion might have been avoided. So even though the rotum was sent timely that it, not, it was not utilized properly uh, in the management of this trauma patient. So after the surgery, patient was transferred to the ICU with incubator, and we decided to sedate, paralyze, and ventilate the patient. By this time, he was hemodynamically stable without any anthropic support. Blood pressure was 130 by 90 with respiratory rate around, uh, pulse rate 88 beats per minute. And uh, as we did not get a, a rotum report, it's only a verbal report. We sent another rotum sample at the ICU, which is also uh, normal. And then uh, you can see in the infant, there is a uh, isolated CD prolongation that might be due to contamination with heparin. So uh, to confirm that we could have done hep heptem, but as the patient is stable, in our, uh, stable and we, don't, we didn't want to do further intervention. And blood gas still uh, showed metabolic acidosis with high lactate level. So this patient was managed with uh, fluid resuscitation with balanced crystalloids according to dynamic and static uh, fluid assessment tools. No, more, no further transfusions have been done. So to totally the patient was altogether treated with eight units of blood, uh, 
10 units of FFP and 10 units of platelets and 10 units of cryoprecipitates. His cost of hemoglobin was 10.3 grams per liter and platelet 120,000 with normal coagulation profile. So day two, that closure of laparostomy was done and came up with loop colostomy. And on the next day, patient was extubated. Then the corrective surgeries were done, that is fixation of TB fibular fracture and L1, L2 pedicles for fixation and laminectomy were done once the patient's physiological condition has been stabilized. That was later on. So he faced these problems at ICU, the abdomyolysis with AKI, which was managed with fluid resuscitation and post alkaline diuresis. And sepsis, he had positive acidentobacter sputum culture, ARDS, delirium, and ileus. Although there are directly related causes for this complication in relation to trauma, even unnecessary blood and product transfusion might also have uh, contributed to these complications as well. So after one month of hospital stay, the uh, patient was transferred to rehabilitation hospital, Braga. So that's the end of his presentation. And uh, the further the management point will be discussed in case discussion by Madam Nigmini Vijay Suri. So thank you for listening. Over to you, Madam. Let me uh, introduce Dr. Nilmini Jesuria, who actually hardly needs any introduction. Uh, he's a well known consultant anesthetist at uh, Teaching Hospital Ragam, the Karambuna Teaching Hospital. Over to you, Nilmini. Thank you, Shan, for that. Welcome. Uh, as always, anesthetic comes first. Right, so I'm um, just going to move on, <laughs> but they never appreciate that. Then uh, keep the anesthetist waiting, and then when they are getting really late, they tell the anesthetist to start. So both happened today. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Ishan, uh, our good friend, Ishan. Uh, nice to see you here. So uh, the objectives of my talk today is to give you some idea about uh, perioperative bleeding, uh, causes, mechanisms, and the outcomes, and what we normally do. And then introduce, I think I'm sure that most of the registrars and uh, senior registrars here are very familiar with the concept of patient blood management. It's a very uh, frequently asked topic in the exams as well. And basic principles of patient blood management in the perioperative setting, although patient blood management is a concept that is applicable to all settings, but we are concentrating as anesthetists on the perioperative setting and the future developments and any questions, and then we will conclude. Uh, then we'll go for the discussion on cases. So perioperative bleeding, I'm sorry, I can't see the uh, screen here. And once again, let me apologize for the delay. Actually, it was a clash of uh, our schedule. So today was the regional uh, clinical meeting as well. And I was there with uh, the president and one of the vice presidents. The other vice president, Professor Anuja Bedir, who is an anesthetist herself, is unavailable. I think she's at Army Hospital or something like that. So once again, sorry about it. I, I, I know, know, I know, I know. No, 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 I know. no, I know, I know, I know, I know, you were referring to the delay <laughs> there, and uh, sorry for that as well. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, so many millions of surgeries are done worldwide each year, and uh, within 30 days of surgery, we lose about 4.2 million of people. That's about, it contributes to 7.7% of all global deaths. Uh, and perioperative bleeding is one of the major risks that causes this death. And uh, perioperative bleeding is associated with high rate of death and other complications and healthcare resources with prolonged ICU and hospital stay. So mortality, rate, mortality rates due to bleeding is very difficult to actually uh, study, but for elective surgeries, it has been vascular surgery. Elective vascular surgery, it has been calculated to be from 0.1% to 5 to 8%, it's a range. 
and also in the presence of severe bleeding it can even increase up to 20% and it actually remains a common interest between the anesthetist and the surgeons at least uh, because it affects both our fields and what are the mechanisms of perioperative bleeding is quite complex and uh, 75 to 90% of the time bleeding is due to technical problems technical factors and we are more concentrating now on the problems that are related to coagulation uh, related bleeding bleeding so it can be due to any pre existing problems in the patients like congenital uh, bleeding or coagulation abnormalities comorbidities like acquired uh, liver disease or renal disease uh, if the patient had been on anticoagulant especially in an emergency setting and any acquired problems like depends on the surgical procedure and uh, activation of fibrinolytic and inflammatory pathways due to surgical trauma hemostatic impairment due to uh, bleeding itself hemodilution consumption coagulopathy drugs acidosis and hypothermia and any acquired platelet dysfunction so this bleeding causes or leads to vicious vicious cycle of uh, events so bleeding causes hypovolemia it leads to hypotension and with low cardiac output and acidosis poor organ perfusion organ dysfunction which can lead to death and this whole thing can precipitate coagulopathy and massive bleeding and transfusion we have people transfuse uh, generally to overcome this and this can lead to uh, reduce coagulation factors and platelets with hypothermia this vicious cycle is maintained from the screenshot to get so obviously uh, i think uh, that bleeding leads to mortality but there are some uh, recurrences for you to check also and transfusion also increases mortality so with the number of red blood cells transfused the rate of mortality percentage of mortality in patients increase so there is this important concept that we need to understand the triad of independent risk factors for adverse outcomes in a patient who undergoes surgery so anemia iron deficiency and thrombocytopenia coagulopathy and bleeding or blood loss this becomes a triad of uh, independent risk factors which will make the patient to uh, get adverse outcome so what we normally do is uh, traditionally when we see blood uh, okay we get the blood and we transfuse Uh, as much as possible allogenic blood components and generally patients are managed by a single clinician uh, either the anesthetist or the surgeon if the anesthetist is not willing to give blood the surgeon is say my god it's bleeding can you get the blood quickly so sometimes even if he don't want to give blood then we will uh, sometimes we are forced to give the blood thinking that the surgeon might later say my patient died because he didn't give blood so there's no multidisciplinary input in majority of the cases uh, i'm sorry that it has being uh, ishan who is say, staying here not uh, being a surgeon as the uh, pre- representation from slm you know i am not trying to uh, you know attack you <laughs> so then we what we some people what they do is thinking that the patient can bleed we give preemptive transfusion platelets or ffp so these are all unnecessary and we want to have a correct number so yesterday the patient is waiting for surgery tomorrow hemoglobin 8 Uh, the surgical team quickly give blood so that the anesthetist will not refuse to anesthetize this patient with uh, hemoglobin of a so we both have problems that without understanding what we are doing we just try to treat the numbers and the decisions are also made by uh, guided by the poor correlated uh, laboratory tests like uh, i don't think anybody is using bt ct at the moment but there are still some few clinicians who still go by them and even prothrombin inr these tests are also have poor predicted predictive value and point of care viscoelastic testing is either not available or it's not used and if it is not available immediately like at casa street raman is quite lucky uh, it's very difficult to manage these patients using this uh, point of care testing so ultimately the patient gets so much of blood transfused i think as we did saw in case 2 Uh, there will be transfusion related complications i am sure i don't want to go to the list we have learned that in the medical school in our post graduate study so everybody knows what transfusion can cause and i still remember one of the registrars who actually died of anaphylactic reaction to uh, platelets when we were registrars uh, 
those days we used to give platelets when the patient is bleeding and having a low platelet count now we don't even touch platelets with dengue right so these are very very unfortunate events that can happen with transfusion so our own blood because of all these problems people have started to realize that ultimately our own blood is the best thing to have in our veins so therefore this concept of patient blood management actually came to light so it is an evidence based bundle of care that optimizes patient outcomes by managing and preserving patient's own blood the term was coined in 2005 quite a old term to a realign transfusion practice from product to uh, patient focus right so because we are focusing mainly on product most of the time so between 2008 to 2014 a retrospective study over 600000 patients was done in four major hospitals in western australia to assess whether this pbm program is useful or not and it actually they found that it improves patient outcomes reduces blood product utilization with transfusion related cost savings so this was a major study that has been published to show the benefits of patient blood management programs so it has become now an international initiative in best practice for transfusion medicine and it's a multidisciplinary evidence based approach to optimizing the care of patients who might need a blood transfusion and it has a most patient centered approach rather than the product centered approach which we uh, traditional and it ensures that the patient receives the best treatment while avoiding inappropriate use of blood and blood pump is not not to give blood it's to use it rationally and not to give it inappropriately so the what we actually focus is the patient outcome not on the blood or component so all involved in transfusion needs to take the responsibility for the appropriate use of these products so patient blood management um, has been like conceptualized as a three pillar concept optimize erythropoiesis that is your first pillar uh, the second one is minimize ble blood loss and bleeding and increase tolerance to anemia so these are the three important pillars for take home please remember these pillars from egypt right so the three pillars are uh, like uh, complex and for the peri operative period we can put them into this uh, graph to show you how these pillars can be used to optimize the patient outcome in our peri operative management so i'll just go through them uh, in little bit more detail so the in the pre operative period what can we do to improve the patient outcome by using these three pillars so the first pillar is to optimize erythropoiesis so detect investigate and treat anemia and iron deficiency and any other hematemic deficiencies so for the second pillar we minimize blood loss and bleeding so to do that in the pre operative period what we can do is to identify the risks that the patient is having for bleeding intraoperatively and optimize them and in third pillar you increase the tolerance to anemia and use appropriate transfusion triggers by and using optimizing the patient's physiological reserve and other factors so just a, a couple of things that are important is preoperative anemia is surprisingly high it's about 80% of preoperative patients suffer from mild to moderate anemia and there's a meta analysis uh, which shows that there's an association between perioperative preoperative anemia and mortality after surgery and there were 24 studies which start uh, analyzed uh, over close to 950000 patients out of them according to the who definition 39 patients were anemic so perioperative anemia has several uh, factors of uh, leading to anemia uh, the bone marrow suppression due to inflammation from maybe a cancer or ongoing surgical trauma blood loss hemodilution and all these things with iron deficiency uh, nutritional deficiency and medications that can increase the risk of bleeding will ultimately lead to anemia so this graph shows you that anemia increases uh, mortality so most of the time what happens is pre existing anemia is ignored and planned surgery is conducted without correcting 
uh, the anemia or just one or two days before surgery, blood transfusion. That is the traditional method that we see most of the time. So more than 100 million surgeries are performed on anemic patients. And if they start to bleed, then they will need blood intraoperatively or postoperatively. So postpartum hemorrhages, about 6% of all deliveries globally. And recent evidence suggests that there is an association with low prepartum hemoglobin and postpartum hemorrhage. And so how to overcome this problem is the surgical team should refer the patients to the preoperative assessment clinics or they should start using measures to optimize anemia in the ward or at home. So at least four to five weeks before if they refer the patients. Now what we have started at Ragam is we refer the patient to nutritionist and some patients get IV iron although there's no much of uh, studies to show that there is an increased benefit of outcome uh, or they are put on hematemics. So the second pillar in this preoperative uh, period, what we can do to minimize blood loss and bleeding during operation or perioperative period is to take a proper history about bleeding, uh, whether the patient had any excessive bleeding or whether there was a family history or whether the patient is on any anticoagulants or antiplatelets or whether there are any comorbidities. There are so many risk factors which uh, you can use a bleeding assessment tool which has been set, uh, proposed by International Society on Thrombosis and Hemostasis to identify the risk and then optimize these patients. So if the patient has a negative history, you don't need to do any further investigations on bleeding and coagulation assessment because unnecessary, uh, now we had to be very careful also. I think there was a circular from the ministry to avoid doing unnecessary investigations. We are running out of uh, reagents. So please be vigilant on that. And uh, if the patient has a positive history only, you need to do quantitative assessments of uh, bleeding and coagulation problems. And also better to refer the patient to a hematologist or discuss with them to see what exact investigations we need to quantify the risk of bleeding. And we need to follow current guidelines on bridging therapy, which was last exam question also for part two, uh, how to do bridging with anticoagulants, right? And we have to use other measures like preoperative autologous blood donation whenever it is indicated. So the third pillar is to increase the tolerance to anemia and to use adequate or uh, validated transfusion triggers if you if the patient has some deficit. So optimizing physiological resources to treat their medical conditions, get them to the maximum possible optimum, uh, close to optimum con condition. Using prehabilitations is very important in your preoperative assessment clinics, and then we decide on the transfusion triggers. So what can we do in the intraoperative period uh, using these three pillar approach? Schedule elective surgery after hematological optimization. If there's no hurry to operate on the patients, four to five weeks is enough for us to get the hemoglobin without giving any blood transfusions. And the second pillar, there are uh, strategies that we can use, I will just uh, keep inform you a little bit about that and so close collaboration between anesthetists, surgeons, hematologists and transfusion is extremely important to make that uh, blood management successful. So uh, another surgeon here. So surgical techniques have to be, I think most of the surgeons nowadays they prefer to do minimally invasive techniques to minimize that one advantage is minimizing blood loss as well and using meticulous surgical technique using tourniquets and diatomy and cell sedwage, which is, uh, I think, still not available in Sri Lanka. Uh, there is a study to show that it reduces risk of allergenic transfusion by about 54%. And cell salvage is most of the time uh, accepted by the Jehovah's Witness. And uh, mind you, a lot of studies have been done on Jehovah's Witness patients to show that people can tolerate anemia. So anesthetics can contribute to minimizing blood loss by giving neuraxial blocks uh, whenever possible and appropriate positioning of the patient. Uh, fluid management uh, with the, using pre-dilution, maintain normothermia and uh, avoiding liberal fluid strategy, right? Uh, and also avoid acidosis and use controlled hypotension when there is no contraindication for that. And optimizing ventilation and oxygenation is extremely important to maintain the patient's physiological parameters within normal possible range. 
then we can use pharmacological and hematinic uh, hematostatic uh, hemostatic techniques like uh, uh, tranexamic acid this uh, has become a very very popular drug now and in the united kingdom some of the guidelines recommend to give tranexamic as a prophylaxis when the blood loss is expected to increase uh, to uh, exceed 500 ml uh, and it is shown to reduce blood loss by about one third and decrease the rate of allogenic blood transfusions as well so and tranexamic acid has no evidence to show that it increases the risk of thromboembolism. And sometimes we can use desmopressine when it is uh, indicated and topical hemostatic agents, a lot of surgeons use these uh, things like fibrin sealants, gelatin thrombin matrices for uh, difficult to control bleeding situations. So giving blood products, uh, if you look at the procoagulants that are available, they are quite useful uh, rather than giving large number of uh, blood components. But unfortunately, they are not freely available and they are very expensive in our setup. So if you can use these uh, procoagulants uh, targeted for uh, with the factors that are derived from plasma, they are quite beneficial. Uh, sometimes they are recombinant factors and they have a better efficacy uh, as a high concentration of factors can be given compared to uh, the number of uh, plasma units you had to give by with that you can overload the patient and also they have uh, less efficacy and has a lot of safety concerns and the procoagulants are very easily you can dilute them and give it very quickly so they are rapidly available in any emergency bleeding situations and they are shown to lead to a quicker and stronger clot formation also. So we have uh, three or four factor prothrombin complex concentrates, fibrinogen concentrates, and factor seven eight uh, concentrates to uh, be used. So about the goal directed point of care viscoelastic testing, I think when you compare the two cases that we discussed, you can very very be convinced that how a very complex obstetric case was managed with point of care testing available without using so much of blood transfusions and component transfusion. And at the same time, the unavailability of the uh, avail unavailability of the viscoelastic testing has led to maybe unnecessary uh, additional transfusion of unnecessary blood components. So the commonly available methods are thromboelastography, take or rotum, rotational thromboelastometry, and they assess all stages of clot formation in a few minutes. But if you send blood for prothrombin time, it takes at least 77 minutes according to studies, but it may take forever in the hospital setting. And especially this uh, point of care testing is available as validated algorithms for cardiac, liver, trauma, and obstetric uh, cases. So these are the algorithms that are available. Uh, they are all published in recently in the Korean Journal of Anesthesiology in 2019. Uh, I think Madam showed the, the, the algorithm they use at Castle Street for obstetric patients. So in the post-operative period, again, this three-pillar system will help us to optimize the patient's outcome uh, by uh, stimulating erythropoiesis and uh, be very careful, especially in the intensive care unit, to avoid any drugs causing anemia and identify them and treat them. And how do we minimize blood loss? By monitoring, being very vigilant about the drains and the blood loss and maintain normal thermia. When the patient comes from theater, they may be very cold. So we need to warm them up and manage anticoagulation appropriately. And if there's infection, promptly treat. And uh, we can use post-operative cell salvage also connected to drains so that there's autologous transfusion to the uh, patient. So optimize anemia in the uh, as the third pillar minimize oxygen consumption and avoid unnecessary phlebotomy and use restrictive transfusion thresholds so if you look at the phlebotomy it's uh, i think a lot of people uh, lose blood by our investigations we draw and draw and draw and you draw about 20 ml 10 ml is in the dustbin and these patients after uh, in this study after 15 days one patient uh, average has lost about 403 ml of his blood volume, right? Especially this is very important in pediatric patients because you take blood and they, they are ultimately, uh, they, become, they can become anemic due to our interventions. So the uh, 
European Society of Intensive Care Medicine has uh, recently published transfusion strategies in non-bleeding patients and in bleeding critical ill patients. So I'm not going into details about the <clears throat> guidelines. You can uh, download them and read. And uh, restrictive versus liberal uh, strategy is shown to be beneficial in the critically ill patients. So um, now I think we will move on to uh, the, the quiz. After that, we will uh, discuss about the cases. We'll have a short discussion about the points that we can, interesting points in the, uh, I feel nobody's getting up and walking out, I hope. Right, so if any volunteers, you can answer. Uh, patient blood management is a concept to save blood product utilization. Patient blood management is using strategies to save patients' own blood, avoiding allergenic transfusions. A concept which, huh? ah, yeah, yeah, it's a single best answer, sorry. Um, a concept which addresses anemia, blood loss, and coagulopathies to improve patient outcomes, optimum use of blood products. Which one is correct? Correct? Right. Should be, no? Yeah. Because other ones we have to make, no? Yeah. Right. So the question two is uh, allergenic blood transfusions are generally safe with rare complications. Uh, allergenic blood transfusions are supposed to improve patient outcomes. They are cost effective associated with those response relationship with adverse clinical outcomes. Ishan, you want to take the longest answer? I'm really glad that it's you, you here because we can keep the people awake. What is the answer? Can anybody give the answer? Which one? Both. They don't want to talk. They want to show sign language. Right. Yeah. Again, you are correct. No? Again, you are correct. Excellent. I don't know how you guessed that. Right. So question three. I think there's a relationship in that. Tranexamic acid was found to increase venous thrombibulsin in the woman trial. Tranexamic acid reduced all-cause mortality in trauma when administered within three hours of injury in CRASH-2 trial. It is not recommended by WHO as an essential drug. It is not effective when applied locally. Easy to guess now, according to Professor Ishan Sorisa's theory. Yeah, which one is correct? Two. Did you do a study on this? <laughs> Very interesting. Right. Question four. In severe ongoing postpartum hemorrhage during surgery, blood transfusion is unnecessary until the allowable loss is exceeded. FFP is unavoidable. Permissive hypotension is not recommended. Temporary direct aortic compression is useful to restore blood pressure to a uh, acceptable level. Again, four. Brilliant. I think you have done a study on this, how to make MCQs. <laughs> right, so we got the answers. The last one, management of a severely bleeding patient with multiple trauma includes infusion of two liters of ringolactate until blood products are available. Activation of massive blood transfusion protocol if blood pressure remains below uh, 70 millimeter mercury systolic. Initial transfusion of cryoprecipitate as fibrinogen depletion occurs. Administration of desmopressine as soon as possible. Yes. Now difficult to say which one is the longest, no? Maybe only one or two letters longer. 
Yes. Which one? Two. Anybody has any different ideas? That's the longest answer, isn't it? Yes. Right. Any questions from that? Any controversies? All clear? Right. So now we are going to move on to the discussion more, a little bit more about the cases that we were discussing. And I invite Dr. Pramani Palamunda to uh, discuss the first case. Yeah, to see whether we have actually used the principles of PBM to manage these patients. Can we remove this uh, because it's disturbing the children? Sorry. No, no, I'll minimize that. Right, fine. Right, so um, have we used the, the principles of PBM in the management of this uh, postpartum hemorrhage patient? So uh, according to the definition, now I have picked there, you can see, uh, the, according to the Society for the Advancement of Blood Management, now PBM is timely application of evidence-based medical and surgical concepts to maintain hemoglobin concentration, optimize hemostasis, minimize blood loss to improve patient outcomes. And there is no emphasis on reducing use of blood components. But it is a consequence of other actions. When you are taking other actions, automatically the, the blood component transfusion becomes reduced. We are not, uh, not uh, uh, deliberately trying to reduce. No, no, we shouldn't give blood. Not like that. When you are taking other actions, it happens automatically. And it has to be tailored to individual patient needs. Now, in our case, I think we have... Um, used all these medical and surgical concepts according to NATA consensus guidelines, then RCOG green top guidelines. According to that, we have used medical. I'll come to that in the other slides later. And we have timely uh, treated the patient, um, especially with the use of Rotom. There was no delay in um, transfusion of the necessary blood products, avoiding the unnecessary. Now, to maintain hemoglobin concentration, um, now in the preoperative setting, um, the obstetrician, the obstetric team had given two units of blood to in, improve the hemoglobin concentration to 10.5 because the H, initial HB had been 8. At that time, the patient was on iron therapy, the oral iron. Um, but they couldn't uh, wait for a long period as well because uh, that surgery had to be done early, within one week. So uh, probably that may be the reason uh, for uh, giving blood. So anyway, I feel that uh, blood, those two blood transfusions could have been avoided. And the other thing, uh, the, the now uh, during surgery, now, we, we used allogenic blood. Uh, we, we had to use seven units of blood in that patient. Now, uh, we have actually, if we had cell salvage uh, available to us, we could have reduced the allogenic blood transfusions, give her own blood back after, you know, uh, cleaning through the, uh, the cell salvage system. So uh, that is something which we don't have. Uh, I think in Sri Lanka, these uh, cell salvage machines are not available. Now going through uh, the, each pillar, now um, I think I don't want to go into details again as Nilmini um, uh, Madam has gone through it. But uh, I think pre-operatively um, in the first pillar, we had uh, done certain things but we could have avoided blood transfusion. But it, I think the pre-op management was quite um, uh, adequate in that patient. Now, um, in the second pillar, now identify and managing, pre-operatively in the second pillar, identifying and managing uh, the bleeding risk. Now, this patient was identified uh, pre-operatively as having placenta uh, percreta. It was diagnosed. Now, if this had not been diagnosed 
and trying to do a cesarean section on an undiagnosed patient. Now, what, what could have happened? She could have died even. That, that happens. It still happens in our country in some hospitals because of the, um, the, the you know, so we have to, um, uh, you know, suspect and look for it. Now, here in this patient, she had undergone three uh, cesarean sections in the past. And she had low uh, placenta previa in addition. So um, it was essential. It's not only the obstetrician. Even the anesthetist can question before anesthetizing. Especially when there is a history of uh, past cesarean section or any other scar. Maybe a myomectomy. And having a, a placenta over that. Over the scar. So very high risk of um, having a, a placenta uh, accreta. That is invasion. Abnormal invasion. So we have to suspect that and then uh, do the necessary investigation. So here it is the ultrasound scan. Uh, in uh, some countries, even uh, MRI is done, but in our country, it is uh, usually not done. MRI is not done for the diagnostic purposes. So the education of the uh, obstetrician regarding this, unless you specifically look for it, it can be missed. So suspect and look for it. So then it can be identified. So there are specific features. So, so that was done actually. And this patient was diagnosed uh, in the provincial hospital because it was a major degree um, per creta with a very high risk of bleeding. Uh, they, they thought it, the patient would be managed better in a, at Castle Street uh, with the experience because we are doing uh, low, uh, I mean, more cases compared to that provincial hospital, we, we get a lot of transfer cases. So therefore, with our experience, they thought uh, the patient would have a better outcome by uh, transferring. So transferring that case uh, was good. So I think uh, that step uh, was taken. Um, and pre-operative planning is very important. So we have taken all those steps. Uh, then uh, pre-operatively in the third pillar, uh, we have, uh, there was, I mean, patient was physically fit apart from the bronchial asthma part. So that part was improved. Otherwise, we, we didn't have much to do. Um, and um, <laughs> uh, the, the, having a plan, formulate patient-specific management plan using appropriate uh, blood conservation and modality. So we had a plan before doing surgery. So having a plan is also very important, right? Um, then the uh, timing of surgery was done uh, accordingly, but we, we couldn't wait till the hemoglobin was optimized to 11. Now, anemia in pregnancies when the HB is less than 11 grams. So uh, we, we didn't wait till the HB become uh, 11 grams, but it was 10.5. Um, because uh, the anemia, as uh, Dr. Uh, Nilmini pointed out, pre, uh, anemia uh, immediately before surgery can precipitate uh, hemorrhage, that is due to uterine atrium. So that was corrected. Then during intraoperatively, uh, in the second pillar, the meticulous uh, hemostasis and surgical techniques, we have taken all that. We have, I think we managed that patient uh, optimally. Um, then the post-operatively also, I think um, uh, we had done uh, almost uh, the things needed. I, I don't want to waste time going through each one by one. So um, uh, here again, I have uh, tried to uh, summarize that uh, pre-operatively past disorder detected and patient transferred to hospital with all facilities and expertise and blood transfusion could have been avoided as I mentioned earlier. And Though we didn't have a formal MDT meeting, um, yeah, the plan was discussed and um, we, we had the proper planning. But I think um, uh, this is something we, we should have a MDT meeting for these patients as well with uh, all the transfusion medicine specialists, hematologists and so on. But at the same time, I have to tell you, if we take all the steps and manage according to you know the guidelines with the use of uh, point of care um, thromboelastometry, uh, anesthetists can handle the bleeding during surgery. Most of the time, if rarely it will go into a state uh, you know uh, very bad situation where the, the the transfusion medicine or the hematologist involvement is needed. So anesthetists can handle initial bleeding anyway. So if that is managed properly, 
um, uh, there won't be a major problem. Then intraoperatively, we have taken uh, all the, the, the recommendations, evidence-based concepts we have used to manage this patient. The, as I said earlier, cell salvage was indicated in this patient, but unfortunately, uh, we don't have that facility and we are working on that, I hope, in the future, once these problems are over, you know, uh, very soon. Um, I hope that uh, that is something, these machines are not very expensive. So, um, uh, so that we can uh, minimize allogenic blood transfusions. And then post-operatively, we, we accepted that the hemoglobin 9.5 as uh, adequate and that patient uh, could tolerate that and avoided all the complications of bl blood, massive blood, blood transfusion, that is transfusion associated circulatory overload, BIC, trali. There was no problem at all. And there was no paralytic chylias, acute kidney injury. These are the common problems you see after um, a major hemorrhage. Um, and our anesthesia, we did it under combined spinal epidural. And we have observed, I have personally observed by after, after general anesthesia, most of these problems um, will appear, especially paralytic chylias, because you have to give morphine infusions. We have observed. So, um, uh, so here, uh, and during surgery also, blood loss is minimized by the uh, combined spinal epidural anesthesia because in the, uh, the surgical field, the venous and arterial blood pressures are kept at a low. And it has been um, shown in several studies, uh, meta-analysis, um, that uh, the, the blood loss during surgery was low, uh, significantly low under regional anesthesia when you compare it with GA during uh, this uh, fast uh, surgery for placenta accreta disorders. Right, and this care bundle, I always uh, um, emphasize on this. If we, uh, now this was introduced by the National Safety Agency UK together with um, the Royal College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists. Um, and uh, if, when we go through all these deaths occurring in some hospitals, especially peripheral uh, hospitals, where the knowing that the patient had the placenta accreta, major degree placenta previa, just the SHO had started the surgery. So these things happen. But if we try to take all these precautions, these are also included in the patient blood manage, how to minimize bleeding and how to improve the outcome. So consult an obstetrician planning and directly physically doing the surgery without allowing a junior person to do it. Similarly, the anesthetics. Consultant anesthetics should be there attending to the patient. So these steps are very, very important to minimize bleeding and to minimize complications and to improve patient outcome. Um, so having blood in the operating theater, with knowing that the patient is going to bleed. So we have blood already. So without any delay, you can immediately start. The blood is already connected to the rapid infuser. It is just to start blood, just to set the machine. So, um, so these things are very important. Now in this patient, somebody might think, um, now anyway, you had given a lot of blood to this patient. Now in a situation like this massive hemorrhage, this patient had, by definition, had a massive hemorrhage. Initial blood loss, the rate of loss was more than 150 ml per minute. So we couldn't wait till the patient uh, loses the allowable blood loss. Here in a massive hemorrhage situation, you know, rapid bleeding situation, you can't wait until the patient loses this allowable blood, lo blood loss. If you wait, that will be the end. So with the rate of bleeding only, you have to commence blood transfusion. So it was unavoidable in this um, patient. But what could have been done was to use the patient's own blood, reused by having uh, doing a cell salvage, but we didn't have that facility. And the crystalloids are also minimized. We replace blood loss with blood, minimizing the crystalloid to prevent dilution coagulopathy. That is one of the factors lead to the development of this um, uh, the triad, uh, the triangle of death. So uh, to minimize that, um, the unnecessary crystalloids also 
were avoided, transfusion was avoided. So the coagulation factor transfusion was minimal. Now you, you saw that the, we, we gave only uh, 15 units of cryoprecipitate to this patient and that was the need actually. The other, none of the other factors are needed in this patient. So when we um, look at that, we have given the necessary blood product with a minimum volume, it was about 115. Now say if we had followed the transfusion, the, the massive transfusion protocol, you can see one needs to one needs to one. Minimally, we could have given seven units FFP, seven units, units platelets. So that amounting to more than 2000 in there, right? So the volume overload, especially in the pregnant mothers, we have to be very careful. They are very prone to develop pulmonary edema despite the deficits of volume. If we transfuse uh, large volumes rapidly, uh, they can develop pulmonary edema. So all these complications are minimized. So it, I see that as the good practice. So blood and blood products transfusion was tailored to the patient's need. So that is one of the PBM concepts tailoring to the patient's requirement. You can't practice, I mean, it is not good practice to use a general one needs to one needs to one to each and every bleeding patient. So without delay, other thing, you tailor it without delay, timely uh, replacement. So time, to do it time, in timely manner, you need to have your um, uh, TEG machine or the Rotom machine at point of care not far away. It may be okay to have far away, but you should be able to get the uh, report very quickly, uh, at least the pictures, right? It is not only the number, the graph, shape of the graph, all are very useful. So, um, so point of care is the important thing there. I have to emphasize having it point of care, then you can um, correct these things uh, very quickly. And uh, so that the hemostasis was achieved with minimum blood products and volume. And that now we don't have the um, uh, fibrinogen concentrates. Uh, it was available, a uh, very limited amount. So the best thing is to have fibrinogen concentrate. Now here we have used cryo. Fibrinogen concentrate is, is coming like an antibiotic bottle, small bottle, like a kefiroxine bottle. So just to dissolve it and give it to the patient. Uh, so that is another development we should have. So there is um, no uh, time wasting. If we detect this problem, uh, fibrinogen is low, quickly dissolve it and give it. So that those are the things we, we should have in the future. Uh, so I think I, I would like to um, end my discussion here. And Yunani, I, I think Yunani will be doing the medal. All right. All right. So, I think that was a very well managed example. That so we selected two cases to show you how very uh, pre, uh, um, PBM can improve patients' outcomes without uh, using too much of uh, products if it is not necessary. Right. So uh, about the second case, uh, sorry, yeah, second case, the trauma patient. Um, uh, shall we look at now? This was an emergence, so we had no. The people who manage this patient didn't have time to do anything to optimize his uh, hemoglobin preoperatively. But uh, what do you think about the initial resuscitation and stabilization of the patient? Now, patient came to a, the nearest hospital uh, where this patient uh, was having multiple trauma after a young patient, after a multiple uh, trauma after a road traffic accident, I mean, train accident. And patient... Uh, uh, had a grade two splenic laceration and had a spinal trauma and the patient had a blood pressure of 85, um, initially 70, three units of blood was given and the patient was transferred to National Hospital for Management of Trauma. What do you think about that? Can somebody talk and it's going to be boring otherwise. So initial resuscitation to minimize bleeding or is there any uh, steps taken to do that? 
Is there a deficit in the management? Can we do better? What will you do if you face with a patient like this? Will you transfer for spinal trauma management? They actually fix the spine on the 12th day. So what takes priority in primary survey? So it was a hemodynamically unstable patient and we couldn't find the notes on tranexamic acid, whether it was given or not was not very clear. But now in the modern days, uh, everybody knows that we have to give tranexamic acid as soon as possible if it is within three hours of trauma, uh, but we couldn't find it. So the note keeping is also very important because I think the second uh, where the patient came to our room, there also there was no note, isn't it? Whether tranexamic was given. Uh, so this is, uh, I think, uh, not very, uh, not good practice. So if you have given, you had to record it. If it was not given, then at least Within three hours, it should have been given. So, uh, patient was given two liters of crystalloids. Now, uh, what do you think about that? Is it uh, too much or too low? I think it's too much, right? So, because don't uh, we don't transfuse unnecessary crystalloids uh, that can cause dilution of coagulopathy and it can precipitate or start the vicious cycle. Then about activation of uh, massive transfusion protocol or the point of care testing. What do you think is better in this kind of a situation? In trauma where a patient is unstable, bleeding. Especially in a place where you don't have point of care testing. I think starting, starting massive transfusion protocol is reasonable. But uh, then at least it should be guided by the totem. Right? So there are validated protocols for trauma management also now available. And then uh, giving vesopressors before optimizing the physiology cardiovascular system. Noradrenaline was started at the very beginning when they detected that the patient's blood pressure was 70, three units of blood given and then noradrenaline was started. So I think it is also not an acceptable way of uh, managing the physiology of the patient, isn't it? So that can cause uh, lead to unnecessary multi-organ failure due to vasoconstriction. So patients should have uh, in, in that particular hospital had facilities to do a laparotomy. So the patient should have been uh, should they should have taken the patient to theater if the patient was unstable with a uh, fast scan uh, evidence with grade two uh, splenic laceration. The patient was uh, transferred for spinal trauma management is uh, I don't think that is good practice. The patient could have died on the way on admission to the uh, teaching uh, and the tertiary care center. So there's a talk about giving fixed ratio driven massive transfusion protocol or goal directed therapy and PBM. So in emergency like here now we what we normally do is we have the shock packs in the blood transfusion blood blood, uh, blood bank. So uh, and triggering that is also not uniform. In different hospitals, they have different protocols also. So if you use it without any rationale, a patient can get all the transfusion related complications. Like in this patient, what were the problems this patient had? Patient had ARDS when the patient had, didn't have any uh, chest injury. So it looks like patient was over transfused, right? Uh, and the patient ended up with ILS, obviously, because of laparotomy, that can be a result. But at the same time, if the gut was uh, congested, that can also cause prolonged ILS. So, until the blood loss is about 1 to 1.5 liters, and if you don't have point of care testing available immediately, then, of course, uh, you can get into problems. But if you still have the testing, then you can rationalize and give transfusion that will not complicate the coagulopathy further. So as I mentioned earlier, these guidelines are very important and it is very important to understand the pathophysiology, pathophysiology of post-traumatic coagulopathy to improve management strategies. And the individualized goal-directed treatment improves patient outcome. Also education and establishment of and adherence to clinical management algorithms, going by algorithms is imperative for successful outcome in trauma. I think one of the uh, themes in SLMA is also improving road traffic safety in Sri Lanka, isn't it? So I think it's quite 
the topical uh, to discuss about trauma today. So the challenges, uh, I think these, uh, we, we, we are looking back at what somebody else has done and this patient was encountered by the uh, anesthetic team in the intensive care unit. Uh, and uh, by that time, everything has happened. I think the main challenges are the lack of knowledge about trauma resuscitation in the first responders still. And uh, they don't know how to prioritize the management. And that is where the involvement of consultants come into play that uh, to improve the patient outcome, we need to intervene very early. And the massive transfusion protocols, uh, as this patient had had some uh, complications and uh, in the ICU also, lack of this can cause to uh, problems of managing the patient. So going back to, are there any questions? So what I wanted to say is why now we have gone through all these things and I think uh, most of the people may have heard about uh, PBM and I think a lot of uh, clinicians have heard the term, but they actually don't have the clear idea about what patient blood management is because people think it is to restrict giving blood and components. It is not. And it is to improve outcomes by managing it uh, using this three pillar concept. So uh, uh, the, uh, the, some people say that the old habits die hard. So similarly, uh, our management of these patients, traditional way is very difficult to change. So lack of awareness about PBM uh, principles is uh, among clinicians, administrators, and uh, advisors is a major problem to implement this uh, concept. And there was an interesting study in 1990 where influence of clinical knowledge, organizational context, and practice style on transfusion decision making implications for practice uh, change strategies. We showed that amount of transfused products was inversely proportional to the clinician's knowledge of transfusion medicine. Right? So the less we know, the more blood we give because we are worried that the patient might otherwise die. So, and the problem is, is there's a lot of resistance to change long. Uh, standing current practices and I'm really sometimes uh, even if I don't want to give blood I have this uh, I face that when the surgeon is worried that patient might bleed more and not to give it also yeah that's another thing send back yeah now it is there you should not waste it and you just give it to the patient you get the FFP thawed, aparade uh, wasting, and then you just transfuse. It should not happen. So that is why it's very important to do a precision uh, management of each patient. And uh, we have the lack of infrastructure, and I think we are heading towards a uh, very trying time. So uh, having sales salvage machines I, may be a dream in our uh, lifetime, maybe when you all become consultants uh, and may be available. Uh, so a lack of validated algorithms or not using them when they are available is also a problem that we need to change. So this, this, these are the barriers for implementation. And uh, there are uh, three E's, which is the evidence, economics, and ethics, which dictates that delaying trans uh, PBM implementation increases morbidity and mortality. And uh, there is an urgent need. So the WHO has taken the initiative uh, by issuing a policy brief to uh, about the urgent need to implement patient blood management. And uh, they are in the process of developing guidelines to serve as a framework for, framework for healthcare leaders worldwide. So uh, with COVID, implementation of blood management has become even more crucial because of the lack of uh, donations and reduced number of donations. And I think uh, with the current economic situation in our country, I think we also need to be very thoughtful and mindful about how we use our uh, limited resources that are available. And uh, in response to the WHO uh, uh, policy, the College of Anesthesiologists and Intensivists of Sri Lanka is also initiating implementation of PBM in the perioperative setting uh, as one of the patient safety and quality improvement projects uh, done by the college. And we are planning to invite all stakeholders, including uh, surgeons, transfusionists, hematologists, um, to form a working group uh, and to try and see whether we can implement these principles in uh, patient management and to improve the outcomes in perioperative setting. Right. I hope that you don't have any more questions. Um, 
Mm. Do you have anything please ask from the expert panel here? Yes. No, no, I'm just uh, concluding. <laughs> uh, so the major, uh, if there are no questions uh, to conclude, uh, it's a key concern for both anesthetic and surgical teams. And to mitigate these complications, we should implement patient blood management best as best practice. And also using this multidisciplinary three pillar concept. And WHO is currently processing this and a paradigm shift of current bleeding management is very essential in our country also. And timely implementation will improve patient safety. Thank you for listening. On behalf of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, let me thank the College of Anesthesiologists and Intensivists for this uh, excellent uh, performance today, particularly um, the talks on uh, uh, patient, uh, patient blood management and uh, a, a very important topic because we all know that there is a lot of inappropriate use of uh, blood and blood products and uh, I think it was a very, very, very informative session. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I now have the pleasant task of uh, handing over the letters of participation to the resource persons. Dr. Ramani Pallemi. On behalf of the College of Anesthesiologists and Intensives of Sri Lanka, I would like to uh, thank uh, Prof. Ishan Soisa with this very busy schedule for being able to come and grace this occasion. Thank you very much for SLMA for inviting us for this topic today. Thank you.